Let's get this show on the road. I guess that phrase came from a probably um, circus folk. Maybe traveling performers of some sort. Uh, okay. Make sure you guys can hear all this. Make it as loud as possible. You know, so that's what this video is. It's not to convince you, not that I'm right, not that I have the truth, although I think it is the truth, the objective truth that we should be living out here. Okay, so ER thinks that the objective truth to him, and that's what I love about him, by the way, is that he he's pretty secure, pretty secure in his convictions, but he's willing to admit that there is a possibility he's wrong, and um, I think he's open-minded enough to potentially recognize that if uh, the truth makes itself ever so apparent at some point in the future. My objection to that is, overall, I think, his philosophy that we... I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm actually going to be paraphrasing most of his stuff here, so if you haven't seen the video, we belong in nature, parentheses, civilization is cancer. I recommend go watch it. I'm going to be responding directly to a couple of his ideas here. And objective truth is that we should live in the wild. He thinks meaning, the most meaning we can find in life will come from this. I would object to that by saying that, in a way, that's shirking the individual's responsibility to act as a, act as a, not only supporter, that's a partial role, supporter because we were beneficiaries growing up, but a, what's the popular word nowadays, trans, um, transformer, a, a transfigurative actor figure in the civilization. I think that we, the, the more I'm reading, the more I'm understanding that the history we are a part of, the history that evolved and um, were acted as the precursor to our existence right now, at least all I can speak for is my society, it, it's composed of unfathomably complex leaps forward mm, very I don't want to keep using the same word very um, profound quantum leaps forward in ideas and technological developments and we owe a lot to it. That's that's essentially my argument against him, is that despite and I would I would I would shift his characterization of civilization as being a cancer to actually being an organism with potential bouts of cancer. Although I don't think they're malignant, mortal. 
think they're more benign forms of cancer, to continue the analogy, that right now are in the early phases in which we can cut them out and successfully operate on them, or even on a more fundamental analog, analog level. We could maybe act as the um, pathogen destroyers in the immuno immune system of our, uh, of our organization, of our, the organism that is our civilization. So, my take on it is that he wants to And again, I'm paraphrasing, and I, I would like to honestly, genuinely hear his feedback on this, because most of his video, um, he admittedly said that he could talk for hours, hours, hours on this, so I would, uh, I would love to hear his more broad scope theory on where he's going with transforming the essence of society into a more primal, I mean, he's talking about shirking, uh, removing any sort of technology uh, beyond that which we would be able to manufacture ourselves personally for, out of wood, and I mean, he's not approaching it in a very practical manner, and he admittedly says that it would be existential suicide to do so. Because, essentially, and I agree with him, nobody is prepared to survive in the wild the way he is suggesting we should. So, that's why I think that the, he's leaving the specifics up to either debate or further explanation in a future video. Maybe depending on his response that he got. So, I would like to support him and show support for his um, courage. It's pretty inspiring. I, I think he's an inspiring figure, and yeah, I don't know how long I'm going to make this video, but um, in case I don't get to it, I think he is paradoxically, maybe ironically is, better, is the better word for his situation. A, I think he's living out the solution to his proposed problem with society, which is that we're all slaves and we can't find any meaning in current society the way it's structured, so we need to revert back to a primal, much smaller, more tribal, more family-oriented way of living, and thereby getting a lot more meaning because we'll have less obedience to larger inhuman um, uh, indifferent our role will be a lot more tangible and apparent and meaningful because it will be a lot more a lot less removed from this very factory oh, what's the word I'm thinking of kind of a like um, lack of humanity structure with that man that essentially doesn't prioritize the human element and doesn't prioritize meaning gained from economic work. So he thinks we'll be a lot closer to our, um, this in the supply chain, we'll, we'll have a lot more say, and we will, as far as producing or hunting your food from farm to table, so to speak. You will essentially be the sole arbiter as opposed to us being a um, very far removed 
and um, very compartmentalized cog in the wheel of the process as a whole, economic process. I think he uh, he thinks that will bring more meaning. I think I think he makes a lot of good points, but ultimately I don't I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's a I don't think you could actually it's practical in the sense that we could act it out. And I would love to hear his response to that. You know, cuz I think all the intricacies, all the actual real complexities of it would be in the details of it, so you know. It's hard enough to make an idea that makes some sort of sense in regards to forming an, a viable alternative to an already existing, um, some could argue, functional civil civilization structure. Yet it's, it's got to be even harder still to actually come up with something that would technically work in the smallest details of it. So it would be interesting to hear him flesh that out a little bit. So Paul, and I never realized your name was Paul until you said it a few times in your video. Whether I, I most likely you won't even see this, so I guess I'll uh, I'll go ahead and just direct this towards the people I know who will see it. Uh, so I won't I won't bother addressing you directly except for that right there. But uh, I hope I hope Paul does see this and um, Er I think before any misconceptions get formulated in anybody's minds that this is a, I don't know, a hit on his character or something like that, or a, um, some sort of attempt to, uh, you know, knock, knock down his argument based on, um, you know, something, some, some attack on his character or, or him as a human being. I think, honestly, he he's a pretty inspiring individual. I mean, he's obviously very successful with his YouTube channel. He's obviously helped a lot of people get to sleep, which is one of the most important facets of our lives. So, blanket statement, I firmly stand by him. I think he's a creative, um, intelligent, really successful human being, I think, in general, so, I think, ironically, he's wanting to dismiss all the technology that has allowed him to, uh, maybe start a second career, second life, I don't know if he, I, I, I would assume he does it full time, because he puts out a lot of content, and, um, and I know just me personally trying to trying to be consistent with my material and put it out every other day. It, it takes quite a bit of effort. So I can imagine he has used this to uh, just revamp his career and maybe give more meaning to his life than he had previously. And maybe that's what's bolstering him to be courageous enough to put his put forth his argument with his face in the video and his his name on his main channel at the uh, at the risk of his reputation perhaps maybe maybe he considered that so essentially I just want to praise his courage and um, show support for it, really, despite me trying to argue against a lot of his positions. There's a, there's definitely a significant amount of things I agree with him about in this video. So I guess we're, um, well past the intro, but, uh, it's fun anyway, I'm gonna try to just wing it. 
I don't really have, this is going to be just a half-witted reply, really, it's just kind of off the cuff, I just finished, I'm in, um, I'm going to try to incorporate some of the books that I've been reading recently in it, uh, in, in my responses, um, being the uh, Walter Kaufman's two books, Nietzsche and, uh, got Nietzsche here, if you guys can see I've shown this book plenty of times, and uh, I have quite a few passages I might be able to support some of my arguments with in here. Um, and then the other one I'm currently reading is Shakespeare to Existentialism, which talks about Goethe, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Rilke, Freud. Jaspers, Heidegger, and Toynbee. And Rilke and Toynbee I hadn't even ever heard of, honestly, so I'm not to the part of the book where we're discussing that, but I do have a passage or two in here. And uh, secondly, I'm sure you guys can see it right there is Jordan Peterson's new book 12 Rules for Life so which I, I I'm not a patron of his I haven't supported him financially uh, so I ended up just getting the book and buying the audiobook as well which he read personally so honestly I don't think after I'm going to have to go back and because I the, there's a lot of very crucial information that um, I feel like uh, it would be invaluable and would be very uh, wise for me to go back and, and review and underline and, and maybe really incorporate into my, really drill home into my memory uh, a little more, a lot of axioms, a lot of a lot of scientific concepts too that we'll um, we'll talk about in here too. So I got one or two things I'm gonna bring up, but I would highly recommend that book. By the way, I know I always mention Jordan Peterson, yeah, but that's just because he. I don't know. I'm you know, at the risk of sounding like a shill. I guess, I don't know, I guess you're not a shill if you admit that, no, I guess, never mind, I don't know, that was, that didn't even make sense before I said it, I don't know why I bothered saying it, because uh, a shill, I guess, is someone who gets paid to anonymous, anonymously, um, support, be a proponent, of something, some work, some person, some entity, but um, I'm certainly not getting paid. I just find, out of any one individual, I found really I, I think ever, you know, even more so than Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is more. Well, he's so far removed culturally and temporally from me that there's bound to be a lot of things that I don't understand let alone the fact that he wasn't understood by a lot of people in his own time, of his own stature, academically as well. So, a lot, most of what he says goes right over my head. And, um, I guess Jordan Peterson has a way of, he has a way of articulating himself. And, uh, that, to me, interestingly, interestingly enough, he's admitted to um, cultivating that skill. He said his first book, Maps of Meaning, he wrote three hours a day, pretty much every day for 15 years, rewriting sentences 20 times, um, most sentences in his book. So to me, that's, that's a sign of good faith that he doesn't want to discourage people from thinking that he just formulated these ideas. He popped out. I think he was exceptionally, um, I think he has an exceptionally high IQ, which is according to him, biologically determined, which is something I would love to research a little more. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know why I was like trying to keep my hair all nice, but when I shower, it turns into a pile of hay. So I try to put some conditioner in it to make it look like halfway presentable for a video. Uh, but anyways, Jordan Peterson, he has a lot of arguments that make sense, and he supports them with science, and because uh, he is a scientist first and foremost, and a uh, psychologist, and a, would, he, I've never heard him say he's a philosopher, but he certainly has a worldview, although technically maybe not a coherent, logically waterproof, watertight, I guess, um, philosophy set of arguments. The set of arguments that he proposes are extremely, to me, practical and make a lot of sense. So, anyways, um, you know what, I'm going to probably make this a two-parter, I think, because I have so much to talk about here. But E.R. Paul, uh, it was very thought-provoking, his video, so I just felt compelled because it was so in line with some of the stuff I'm reading right now. And initially, I wanted to literally just make a two-minute introduction to um, trying to up my quality and um, the terseness and trying to be as concise as I can, but I don't know. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I was going to try to rope you guys in with a good, solid, uh, controversial, maybe, um, argument. And then jump right to um, just mentioning my Patreon supporters. <laughs> I don't know. It sounded like a good idea to begin with. But then I just like... But then I, uh, I'm i so disorganized. And I actually wrote down some notes on my little Microsoft. I don't know. In a, in a Word document here. Man, I just kept glancing over and, and wanting to mention them real quick. But... Um, honestly, Sean and Kieran, I just wanted to sit, just give you guys a big thanks um, for showing so much support. And uh, and Joshua, Alexis, and Andy, you guys as well. You guys all really encourage me and keep this channel going by supporting me like that on Patreon. And then Sandy has been a, a blessing, uh, and she's been so encouraging as well. She's uh, supported me through PayPal a couple times, actually, so... And they're in pounds, so I guess she's over in the UK somewhere. And I just want to give a big thanks for you guys, to you guys, for supporting me. It means a lot, and uh, didn't want it to go unnoticed, or unacknowledged at least in my videos. So, thanks again guys. I guess this would be a good time to, and so many of my ideas, because I'm not, even when I was in academics, which I might eventually go back to, I was not in, I was in the STEM fields, so I don't know anything about arguing politics, English philosophy, um, uh, and, and the more complex subjects developed on top of that. And even sociology. I did take a couple anthropology classes because that interests me like no other. But I always prided myself on being more practical and not just following what was super, super interesting to me. Um... Or, or trying to find a good compromise between what was interesting and what was practical. And that's how I ended up in engineering. Because science is interesting, but I didn't see myself excelling so much that I could be a professor. And I know pretty much, unless you have that, you're, you're not going to make too much money. Um, but I guess a good physicist could make a lot of money in the right department of some private company so engineering seemed like the most useful but and uh, that might be a good segue into my my thoughts on Paul's video here 
No, I think I'll just say ER instead, because that makes more sense. Nobody's gonna know who Paul is. Unless you watch the video. Or unless he says that sometimes, I don't know. I haven't really listened to any of his, uh, his podcasts either, which seem really cool, but I just don't have time. I just saw this video and uh, I'm subbed to ER, so I, uh, I thought it was cool. And me trying to be practical, although I didn't end up getting my degree, so ultimately I was just kind of like lazy or maybe cowardly to, um, to, to be, to have the conviction to just follow something through. I don't know, maybe. Maybe that is my issue, but... I do fundamentally, I think that if something isn't practical, isn't useful in your daily life, then it's not going to be, not going to be very, not going to be very meaningful because you can't act it out. So to segue into my critique of ER here, his video, uh, I found a lot of the things he said was just not practical, and first and foremost, I would say calling civilization cancer is one of them. I don't think that viewing the entire structure that has been slowly developed and incrementally, incrementally developed, but at points like the French Revolution, um, you know, pretty much any great revolution, industrial revolution, any great advances in quantum mechanics. It's been more of a leap forward, but ultimately, average on the average, you could say, it's been the product of the slow development of really a continuum. You can't say that anything from from what I understand so this is of course my own opinion it's not reflective of his opinions and with any luck I won't make a straw man out of his arguments the few arguments that I do have so um, and I guess that would be my one you know the, the underlying um, preface disclaimer I just want to say is that uh, I don't claim to be uh completely knowledgeable about all sides of his argument. I think he seems like he has much more to say than he did, like I said in the video, so um, I'm sure I'm going to make a straw man out of his argument more than I'd like to, but I'm going to attempt not to. He... Let's see, where can I start? Well, and I'm not versed enough in the anarchy and everything, but he seems to be an anarchist, at least in a, in a way. He wants to get rid of all major institutions, and essentially, by going back to a tribal lifestyle, he wants to dismiss any major government and what it seems like, what he's implying there is that tribes would, I guess government would emerge out of just the, just the, the structure that he's proposing should exist, us in the wild with minimal technology, if not any, which was an issue right there, um, but my broad point is that uh, I would argue that we have come to where we are through millions of years of evolution, really, culturally, as well as physiologically. Um, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to try my best not to, again, not to, uh, I'm going to try my best to support my arguments and, uh, give you guys an, an idea of where I'm getting them from, 90% of which I'm sure I'm going to just say Jordan Peterson, JPP, but just because if I was watching a video like this, I'd like to know 
if there's an idea I throw out that is interesting to any of you guys, um, I'd like to know where it was from, or at least what direction I could go towards learning more about it. So, um, JBB, generally that's going to mean Carl Jung, um, the guy he mentions, John Piaget, all the time, great psychologist. A lot of psychologists, um, Rogers, uh, Pavlov, obviously, being a behaviorist, I think. He's saying that, I think it's it's uh, not to be dismissed easily that w the civilization, the society, all the institutions is the culmination right now, and I don't think it's the end product, I think. Everything's constantly evolving, and it would be a tyrannical, in tyrannical stasis if it didn't always continue to evolve. But we're the end product so far, and we're the culmination, I think that's the better word, of millions of years of physical evolution, and at least half a million, well, at least 150,000 years, if not more like 600,000 years of cultural evolution uh, I heard the other day that we started using fire like being able to actually use it whether we actually made it is probably a different story but when you have natural forest fires created by lightning striking uh, an area where that's covered in dead foliage I guess you'd say our ability to harness it is at least half a million years old they're saying I just listened to a nature show the other day I can't support that maybe I could yeah if I'm quick-witted enough to uh, keep talking about it but uh, and you can't and and the um, control of fire by early humans here we go, Wikipedia but our earliest cultural myths too um, probably are as old as our ability to consciously articulate them into stories and god knows how long that is you know like this claims and this on wikipedia so it's uh if anything else it's communal knowledge if not a if not a, an authoritative source claims for the earliest definitive evidence of control of fire by a member of homo range from 1.7 to 2 million years ago. So, um, evidence for the controlled use of fire, Homo erectus beginning 600,000 years ago, has wide, wide scholarly support. And flint blades burned in fires roughly 300,000 years ago were found near fossils of early but not entirely modern Homo sapiens in Morocco. and the widespread control of anatomically modern human beings dates to approximately 125,000 years ago. Think about what that means. That means that we had the ability to cognize how to shape. So if we're really conservative and go with the most widely supported scholarly work, um, widely um, one that has the most consensus it's 125,000 years ago and historically we have about 4,000 years of records you know since the maybe 6,000 if you go way 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 back so 2,000 years ago and then 4,000 BC so that's 6,000 years, that's roughly 20 times, uh, 120th of the time span that we've been able as a species, within our own species, Homo sapiens sapiens, we've been able to, we've been recording history written down 120th of the time that we've actually been, had the capacity and been aware of the technology that allowed us to create not just control but actually create 
create fire and stone tools and art as well. Although maybe cave art might only be as old as 40,000 years ago, like uh, Les Aziz and stuff in France. Or that might be the only cave art that uh, we figured out how to make enduring substance um, with. How to, how to make last for a long period of time. So, discovered fire. We, no doubt, and I don't think ER would disagree with the fact that we probably associated fire, just like the Prometheus myth, with our concept of God. I, I would have to say, essentially, that God evolved along with us. Our concept evolved, um, and I think I heard the other day, maybe in the book Sapiens, I heard very few about it. I forget where. Maybe it was Jordan Peterson's book. Because it was 15 hours of him reading. No, no, no. What it was was the uh, transliminal interview. The guy, Jordan, who interviews Jordan Peterson all the time. He was interviewing a soci uh, social anthropologist or someone in that realm of study. And they were saying that the concept of God got more and more sophisticated. And so the Judeo-Christian God, the Muslim God of the Abrahamic traditions was a was essentially the culmination of a God that is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipotent. No, that's the same word. <laughs> and uh, all seeing, all knowing, and all good omnibenevolent and most and that can almost be traced um, God had a smaller and smaller concept but where am I going with this um, I, th I think that was just me my interest is that like the idea of the myth and the myth of God is not just a children's story. It's and it's not just a it's it's not just a easy to use tool for control of the masses, although it can and has been used as that. It's more fundamentally a story of how the most successful, and this is the most important part, most successful not just now, but over the span, the longest possible span of a lifetime, or maybe multiple lifetimes, how to act. So in other words, while though there might be more, and again, Jordan Peterson, don't knock me for referencing him most of the time in this video. I mean, he has a rule. One of his main 12 rules is that do something that's meaningful, not expedient. And if we culturally evolve the idea of God and we are able to tell these stories that, you know, the Judeo-Christian God and maybe, you know, probably, not maybe, but most likely every old myth, Gilgamesh, all these old myths, um, the Babylonian, Mesopotamian, Marduk, uh, the Egyptian, Horus, and Osiris. All these ideas of gods are the, I would say, product of many, many, many thousands of I think about at least 125,000, probably more like half a million years if of uh, of stories told about these great, the greatest species, the greatest members of our species, and the greatest individuals. 
And so what I'm trying to say, it took me 20 minutes to get around to, is that they're not easily dismissed because they contain within them, although they can be dismissed on a literal level as a children's story, something very simple and simple-minded on a more metaphorical level, they cannot be easily dismissed in which what I'm finding out, I mean, uh, through the work of Carl Jung, um, I got Aeon, Carl Jung's Aeon book back there, where he's, essentially, I think that's his theory, is that there was a lot of, a lot of people died and a lot of trial and error before we understood the best way to act. And that came from initially recognizing that we could sacrifice eating a whole bunch today to maybe sh uh, save it for later. Or maybe sacrifice not eating as much as you would to share it with someone in the maybe unconscious knowledge that you will, that act will be reciprocated in the future at some point. And which might have been the origins of this tribal mentality that ER is so fond of. And my point is that it all evolved, and it took time, and it took a lot of dead people to get there. You know, we didn't just think it was a good idea and start implementing it and telling stories about it. We, we had to undergo a lot of suffering, and we still do, to... To arrive at these, we had to go through a lot of wars. We had to go through evolution from small roaming bands of people to larger tribes and then cities and, you know, villages and cities and city states and then government organizations as old as, you know, Hammurabi and, uh, man. ER, I just don't think you can easily dismiss it, you know? Um, I don't think it's... I don't think it would be wise to just dismiss civilization as cancer. And maybe your analogy to steel man your argument would be cancer is the development of healthy cells that get out of control and become a become malignant to the organism in which they in which it, it flourishes and therefore to continue your analogy maybe there's something deeper to you something more meaningful which might be the might be the human species is what you look at as the organism or you might take a more um, a broader view and, and call the entire earth every organism on that as a single or organism and we are maybe not we as a species but our culture our current mode of perception is the cancer in which case I think I think that's partially true, but not enough so to dismiss the whole thing as cancer. And I'd have to say that... Doing so would revert us back to recreating the wheel, essentially. I think I said the other day that, um, why recreate the wheel when you can just shave down some of the um, misshapen areas of it that's causing it to malfunction as correctly as a wheel should um, and, and or not to function as correctly as a wheel should and you know the point is not trying to recreate the wheel and why not use our existing infrastructure I think it would be a lot more practical to use our infrastructure and reshape it rather than re-demolish it and rebuild it. 
I think by going to a primal form mode of being, you would lose, um, you would submit yourself to a, you would expose yourself to so much more danger and existential, uh, suicide, as you said, is, is essentially what it would be. So, yeah, I'm not really sure what, what your, what the details of you would be, so, but, um, let's see, it's 46 minutes, yeah, maybe I can get through this all in one episode. That was probably the world's longest preface to anything, but, I, I just think there's so much evidence that we should, uh, utilize what already exists, and, mm, now I'm beating a dead horse, I know, I know, so, uh, he thinks the most meaning is gonna come from being within a single unit, and, uh, essentially having more time with your family, I think is his main argument. He talks about co-sleeping, and he doesn't believe, he doesn't believe in a lot of the traditions and the way you should act, informed by traditions nowadays, such as leaving your kid to sleep alone in their own room, which I think that's, again, I might be strawmanning him here, but I think that might be pushing the line between, um, I think it's good to form that really strong bond with your child, but at the same time you don't want to overdo it and and allow your kid to not develop independence and be too dependent on you. You want to foster independence and, uh, you know, we're all going to die alone. Whether you have someone, I think Norm MacDonald said that. And it is. You can't take them. You can't just laugh him off because it's it is true we will die alone whether or not you have family members surrounding you holding your hand you're the one who's gonna die you know um and they will continue living and so you you are born alone you do die alone but the meaning that's created through the relationships with other people and particularly your family and loved ones along the way in between there is what makes life worth living, and, uh, what, um, overpowers the will to, uh, to, to commit suicide, or, um, overpowers any overwhelming sense of suffering that might potentially occur. So, I do agree, I have some arguments, if, if he ever, uh, decides to make a response to this, that would be super cool, um, but I do ultimately agree that uh, there are a lot of profound things wrong with our society, but I think the good outweighs the bad over, overall, so we're going to call this the end of part one, it's uh, quite a rambling, unstructured rebuttal to ER there, and so I was hoping to actually have a little more uh, cohesive, coherent, I guess is the better word, and uh, follow more of an outline that I set down, but I don't know, I guess I, uh, like always, I ended up just kind of going ahead and trying to go off the top of my head off the cuff and figure out exactly kind of my own thoughts informed, informed a little bit by some of the notes I took in regards to ER's theory that we should live outside and, um, well not outside, but in a primal setting, and perhaps disregard the cancer that is civilization, so I don't really agree with that, obviously, and, uh, I think this part here, I got a little carried away earlier, as I tend to do, and I recorded nearly two hours of a response, um, all filmed. This is just late at night when I'm editing, so 
figured I'd just throw in a nice cap to part one here. And with any luck, you guys enjoyed it and got something out of it. At least enough to uh, to be able to comment and give me, in turn, a critique on my critique. So I thought it was fun. Um, I thought ER was very informative and very thought-provoking, very sincere in his video that he made. And I didn't want to dismiss any of his arguments as... Well, I didn't want to build them up to be a straw man so I could easily burn them down. And I think... I think, personally, he seems like a really cool guy. Someone I, I could probably talk to for a couple hours over some beers. And, uh, I don't know, maybe one day we can. But, until then, this will have to suffice. And, um... This will wrap up part one, which was essentially me trying to kind of just gather my thoughts on camera, really. Um, clearly, I don't have a solid argument, but hopefully I made some clear points in my venture to uh, organize my own thoughts out loud on camera for you guys to see my intellect developing in front of you with any luck that's uh, some sort of analogy to what's actually going on right there I'm just reading a bunch of books tossing ideas around and um, honestly just talking about it helps consolidate all the good stuff trim the fat I'll go back and listen to it in a week maybe just tomorrow and realize um, some of the unnecessary portions of it, and uh, it'll be a good way to critique myself, but with any luck, a couple of you guys out there will give me a sincere once-over, and um, you'll be able to maybe bring to light any obvious fallacies I might be making, but... I had fun doing it nonetheless, and I was trying basically to, to pull up to the surface of my mind the idea that civilization is something that we can't easily dismiss because it's informed all our conscious being. It's, uh, we we're raised in the landscape of morality that's been shaped by earth, um, by churches, rather, and, uh, by a, a structure of religion that's been instantiated in society for thousands of years now. And, and I think there's a lot of wisdom there that, uh, that ER, I think, himself recognizes we can't just completely dismiss. So that's why I, I was doing the best I could with the, what I understood to be what he delivered in that video. Unless I just forgot some portions where he elucidated, elaborated on the technicalities of how we would live out there, but I, I'm pretty sure he didn't. Nonetheless, I want to thank him for uh, hey, just being inspiring. He's one of the, the, the forgers, path pavers. He's one of the first to do what he did in the ASMR realm. And I hope to be a credible and I don't know, I have to leave a, I have to be a good, what's the word? Ancestor? A good progeny? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but he's a cool guy. I hope he responds. I hope he sees this at least, if not responds, and uh, I'll try to email him and see if I can, um, Maybe get a response out of them or something like that, and uh, maybe we can we can go from there. But uh, until then, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and part two will be coming really soon, hopefully within a day or two. And I hope you guys enjoy it. It's really obviously just the continuation of this video, but I can't imagine anybody would actually 
get through a two hour ASMR video of me talking, so it seemed to me the most practical way to go about it. Either way, thanks again to all my subs, all those likes and comments you leave mean a lot to me, and all my Patreon supporters, my PayPal supporters, and really just all the positive energy and well thought, sincere feedback I always get. Love you guys and uh, hope sincerely that you all are doing well and that you sleep even better. Till next time. Take care.